Hi, welcome to First Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Travis Norton, senior pastor here in Colorado Springs. So glad that you found this site and pray that this time will bless you as you hear the sermon and some of the music from our worship service on Sunday. We're starting a new sermon series today on the parables of Jesus. We'll be doing it all through the summer and really looking at how, how Jesus used stories to change people's minds about some, some uh, tricky subjects. So I encourage you to come and join us for the summer. But as we prepare for our worship today, I invite you into a time of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus who comes looking for us when we are lost and never stops looking until we're found. Help us to have that same heart for others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We're starting a new sermon series today based upon the parables of Jesus. The parables are familiar stories to most of us. Many of us grew up in Sunday school learning about these stories that Jesus told. 
But in truth, they are not meant for children. They are meant for adults. Jesus composed these stories to address serious concerns he had, mostly about the religious elite. He used these stories to help people change their minds about some of their most cherished beliefs. How many of you came to church this morning hoping to have your mind changed? Anyone? <laughs> we don't like having our minds changed, do we? Changing minds is not an easy task. And in our society today, people don't change their minds. They don't rethink things. They just double down on what they already know, what they already believe. They become entrenched. And that's why we're so polarized, because people aren't willing to rethink anything these days. Changing minds is not an easy task. We resist changing our minds, well, because it's hard and it's uncomfortable. It's painful sometimes. We like to have things settled, and we don't appreciate it when someone unsettles us, when someone questions us, when someone tells us that we might be wrong about what we believe. You know who really didn't like to be challenged? The Pharisees. Not only did they have strongly held religious beliefs, but their beliefs were based upon the Bible. And more than that, they taught their beliefs to others. How do you change the minds of people whose beliefs are based on the Bible and are teaching those beliefs to others? Not an easy task. But Jesus took it on. Jesus took a fairly gentle approach with the Pharisees, some of the time. Rather than just tell them how wrong they were and how they needed to change their mind, he told them stories. One of his favorite tactics was to compose a story that reframed an issue to help them see it in a different light so that they might change their mind. And as we go through the parables of Jesus this summer, I invite you to do the same thing, to look at some things that you think you know in a different light and maybe have your mind changed. That means I want us to think of ourselves as Pharisees, which is not a comfortable thing because the Pharisees are the bad guys of Scripture and we want to think of ourselves as the good guys. But there is a reason that we've held on to these stories that Jesus told the Pharisees. Because we still need to learn from Jesus the things he was teaching them, because we still fall into the trap that the Pharisees fell into. Being a Pharisee is simply lacking humility and curiosity to keep learning from God. Being a Pharisee means you think you know what's right and wrong and you never change. Pharisees are those of us who are absolutely certain of our beliefs, and we demand that others get in line and conform to what we already know. So this first parable is actually a series of three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost kid, or the prodigal son. And I'm going to talk about just the first two, but they were all prompted by the same controversy. Jesus was teaching... And the people who were coming to listen to him were tax collectors and sinners, which sounds great, but the Pharisees didn't like it. They didn't like that Jesus was welcoming tax collectors and sinners. They didn't like that he was eating with them. Why was this controversial? Why did it so upset the Pharisees? Well, part of it was about status. You know, we have that issue in our day. Think about uh, certain restaurants or clubs that have, have dress codes or membership requirements, dues, things like that. You have to be a member. You have to pay yearly dues. You might have to wear a jacket to eat there or a collared shirt to play. Now imagine that someone was a member of that club or an owner of that restaurant, and they let people in who didn't follow those rules, who didn't dress according to the dress code, who didn't pay their dues. How would other people feel about that? Well, they would get upset. They'd be annoyed. They're letting anybody in. They're letting in the riffraff. 
I actually heard someone say that when I was living in the south. We were along the, the beach areas and commenting about how expensive certain parts of the beach were. And, and my friend said, you know, I'm kind of glad that it's so expensive. It keeps the riffraff out. Well, Jesus welcomed the riffraff in to places they hadn't previously been welcomed into, where they were normally excluded. So part of the controversy is, is social. It's about class, who eats with whom. But the other part of the controversy was religious. Jesus was eating with people who didn't follow the commandments, who didn't live their lives according to the Bible. And worse, he didn't seem to condemn them for their sinfulness. He didn't demand that they change before he sat down and ate with them. He didn't expect that they follow the, the biblical customs of washing in certain ways before you ate. He seemed to be letting them off the hook of the biblical commandments. And this angered the Pharisees because they followed the rules. They knew the Bible. They kept ritually clean. They washed according to the rules. They were careful about reading the Bible and doing what it said. And instead of getting credit from Jesus for all this, instead of getting an attaboy way to follow the Bible, Jesus is eating with people who don't even know God, who don't follow the rules. Do you see why they're angry? Why they're offended? Now, can you think of any way that we are Pharisees today? It's uncomfortable, I know. But are there people who are sinners who get more attention than you do? You who have worked so hard to be a Christian? Another way to discover who it is is who's getting under your skin these days? Who's making you jealous or annoyed? What makes you say, that's just not right? Who are those people in your book? Jesus hears the grumbling of the Pharisees, and he tells them a story to reframe the issue, to help them see things differently. The first story is about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and finds that one is missing. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, every one of you, if you're in this situation, what would you do? You would leave the 99 and you would go find the one. And if you found the one, you would rejoice and tell your neighbors and throw a party, wouldn't you? And how do you think Jesus hopes the Pharisees hear this story? Could they possibly see that Jesus is eating and welcoming tax collectors and sinners because they're lost and he wants to bring them home? Could the Pharisees see that Jesus isn't paying as much attention to them because he's not as worried about them as he is about those who are far from God? Could the Pharisees even rejoice that these tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear from Jesus, were repenting of their sins and returning to God. I think that's what Jesus wants for the Pharisees. I think that's why Jesus tells them these stories about lost sheep and lost coins and lost kids. Jesus wants the religious to be glad when attention is given to the outsider instead of the insider. Jesus wants the religious to rejoice when those who don't know God's love discover it. And Jesus wants the religious to join him in going out there and seeking and saving the lost, searching until all are found and returned home. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for the church? Who are the lost? Who is the one sheep that has wandered off? Who is the lost coin missing from the woman's purse? Now, we've been doing this survey here at First Lutheran looking toward the future, and one of the questions on the survey asks, what demographic should we focus on in the coming years? Over 200 people have taken the survey, and I'm going to share the results next week, but one of the things that has already stood out to me 
in the way that you've answered is this desire that you have that we focus our attention and energy on young adults, on young people, ages 18 to 30. And the reason that's so interesting to me is that the average person that has filled out this survey is a person between the ages of 70 and 80 years old who's been here for 21 years. <laughs> but you're not saying that we should focus on people who are 70 to 80 who've been here for 20 years. You're saying, don't focus on us. Focus on them, the one who isn't here in our community. And the missing sheep seem to be young adults, those 18 to 30 years old. So when I read the survey results, I hear you saying to me and the other leaders, let's go find them. Let's go out there and find them. Where are they? Why aren't they here with us? I'll admit, I'm surprised you said that. Most of us tend to want people to focus on us and our needs, but you are saying, no, let's go and focus on those who are not like us, who are different in age and experience, who are living in a very different world than the one we grew up in. And so I commend you for this. I find it very Christ-like, very Christian, to be willing to sacrifice having the church pay attention to your needs so that we can focus on the needs of those who aren't here, so that we can focus on the needs of those who don't tithe, who don't volunteer, who aren't contributing to the church. That is very Christ-like and not what I expected, and I apologize for that. But I'm excited to go on this search with you to figure out what it looks like for an older congregation to seek out younger people and invite them in. And I'm not sure what it'll mean. I don't know what we're going to have to change in order for this place to become a place that young people can find faith in Jesus. But I'm excited to figure it out, to take on that challenge with you. I think it helps to remember what it feels like to be lost. It's scary, and it's embarrassing, especially if you're an adult. I've told you this story before, but I'll tell it again. When I was in first grade, I convinced my, uh, my babysitter to let me walk to school. I was only two blocks away. I was sure I could find the way, and I told her that. I went the wrong way immediately. I didn't know I was lost until the school bell rang, and it was coming in the opposite direction. I saw my babysitter realize this quickly and came looking for me in her van, windows rolled down, calling out my name, and what did I do? I hid. <laughs> I went behind a tree because I was embarrassed. I told her I knew my way, and I didn't, and so I hid. She didn't stop looking, though. She kept driving around, windows rolled down, calling out my name, same block, over and over again, until I finally came out from behind the tree and was found, and she took me to school. And I think about that all the time because there are so many people who are spiritually lost. And even if we go looking for them, they don't come running to us. Thank you for coming and finding me. We have to keep going and being persistent and calling out their name and finding new strategies and new ways to, to convince them that, they were, that we're trustworthy, that we love them, and that we know the way home. We're going to have to be like Jesus. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus sacrificed his reputation among the religious so that he could find them. He angered the religious community. He went to where they were, and he didn't demand that they clean themselves up first. And I can't imagine what kind of situations Jesus found himself in, the kind of people and what they were talking about and how they were behaving you know, I'm a pastor, and when I walk into a room, people stop swearing. And if they accidentally do, they apologize to me as if I've never heard a swear word or never said one myself. Can you imagine the kinds of things that Jesus heard among the tax collectors and the sinners? And what did they do when they realized that he was the Messiah, the Son of God? But Jesus went, and he taught them about a loving God, 
and he listened to them, and they listened to him, probably because he didn't judge them, probably because he loved them right where they were, and they could feel it. They knew it. The truth is we're all lost, and we all need to be found again and again by Jesus. He never stops looking for us. He never stops finding us. And we may be embarrassed that we get lost from time to time, that we've sinned again, that we've fallen short, that we've wandered away from the church community. Just as a side note, do you know how hard it is for people who've been gone from church for a while to come back? They're worried about what people are going to ask them. Why were you gone? What did we do? What's wrong? And sometimes just the anticipation of all those questions keep them from coming back, and they stay away even longer until it feels almost impossible to return. But Jesus never stops looking for us. He loves us, and we belong with him. So he forgives us over and over again, and he brings us back home. And then he reminds us that there are others, too, who aren't home yet. And he asks us to join the search party, to go out with him and seek the lost, knowing they might not want to admit that they're lost. The way we find people for God is by loving them right where they are. Love leads to repentance. Acceptance leads to repentance. Notice that when you read the scriptures, you find Jesus eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, but you don't find him condemning them. I don't know any conversation in scripture where Jesus sits down with a prostitute and says, you know, prostitution's wrong, and you should probably stop doing that. He doesn't tell parables about tax collectors telling them how they ought to stop defrauding people. Jesus doesn't spend his time trying to make people feel guilty or ashamed. He spends his time loving people, telling them that God is for them, that God is with them, that even people like them are welcomed into God's kingdom. There's nothing to prevent them from experiencing God's love. Actually, Jesus spends his time defending sinners against the righteous. He spends a lot of his teaching telling the righteous to stop being so judgmental, to, to stop putting burdens on people, to stop creating barriers between people and God. And we all have people in our lives who are lost. We have children and grandchildren and friends and neighbors who aren't home here with us in the church. What sacrifices would Jesus ask us to make to welcome them home? Jesus gave us a tough example to follow. The sacrifices he made to seek and save the lost were more than just enduring the criticism of his peers. He went all the way to the cross to seek and save the lost, and even on the cross found a bandit and offered him paradise. Right then and there. And he did it for each one of us. He has found us when we were lost, and he has brought us home and it feels so good to know that peace and that forgiveness and that salvation. There are people who don't know that. And it's our job to go and tell them. Let's go and find them. And bring them home. Amen? Amen. Amen. We do pray that God spoke to you today through the message. If you want to take next steps, we've created an online course called Basic Training that goes through the basics of the Christian faith uh, step by step. So I encourage you to take that. That's also on this YouTube channel. I encourage you to support this ministry online through your tithes and offerings. You can do that by going to our website, www.flccs.net. And then also in the description of this video, you'll see a link to a connection card. That's a great way to contact us. Let us know if you are moved to come to faith during this time. If you're ready to talk to a pastor about next steps, we'd love to talk to you there. Just let us know that you were here and any comments, we appreciate that. May God bless you as you continue to walk with the Lord.